Ladies and gentlemen, I am Tosh Berman. This is Tosh Talks. Today, I'm going to talk about a book by Ian Buruma. Ian Buruma wrote a book called A Tokyo Romance. Just finished it, brand new. It just came out. Usually, when I talk about books or literature, it's always like books are out of print or have been published years ago. But, you know, I'm slowly but sure I'm getting up to date on current releases. I don't expect this to happen on a regular basis, though. But nevertheless, A Tokyo Romance by Ian Buruma. And Ian Buruma is currently the editor of the New York Review of Books, the journal that's uh, been in existence for, I don't know, 50s, maybe over 60 years. And uh, it's one of the leading sort of intellectual publication on books and on politics. And uh, Baruma is now, well, for I think the past certain amount of years, has been the editor for this uh, prestigious publication. Um, I first heard of Baruma as a writer, as a nonfiction writer, when he wrote a book called Behind the Mask, uh, which was about a book about, it's a book about Japanese culture, but more of the dark aspects of Japanese culture. Um, more about the um, um, more about Japanese underground theater, more about underground manga, and also manga being Japanese comics, a very popular uh, format or form of uh, of, uh, of an art in Japan, as well as Japanese cinema. And I have been going to Japan back and forth for the last like twenty eight years, and um, Buruma. Behind the Mass is one of the first, one, not the first book, but one of the early books I read regarding Japanese culture. The other person I read a lot of, and I still read him on a regular basis, much as like, you know, when his books come upon me, is a, is a writer by the name of Donald Ritchie. And Donald Ritchie is a very important figure for, for introducing the world of Japan, I think, to a Western audience. Uh, Richie is American. He was a GI. He stayed in Japan uh, after the war. He was he was there assigned army duties there, and then he just stayed there after he left the army. And he had an interest in uh, cinema, and he became very close friends of uh, Ozu as well as uh, Ikea Kurosawa, the Japanese, the great Japanese film director. And Richie is one of the first, not one of the first, he's actually the one who's responsible for bringing uh, Ozu's films to America. He's responsible for getting it subtitled in English. He's responsible for helping getting the distribution in America. So he's, he's a very important figure in the Japanese cinema arts, in the fact that he exposed many Japanese filmmakers, classic Japanese filmmakers, to the Western audience. And um, Richie basically is not really attached to any organization of any sorts. I did believe I do believe he taught in New York for a while, but he mostly set himself up as a writer in Japan, and he basically focused on Japanese contemporary culture, I mean 20th century Japanese culture. But he's also quite knowledgeable about Japanese history, and he has written books or articles or essays about ancient or old Japanese uh, literature and culture. But he's a unique guy because he, Richie was a person who, um, who is a foreigner in Japan, was sort of the gateway was the gateway to a certain type of Japanese culture. He knew a lot about the underground Japanese culture as well as the commercial Japanese culture. So when you read books by Richie, you're getting a man of taste who's sort of introducing you to a very interesting aspect of Japanese uh, culture, popular culture as well as artistic culture. And I don't want, I make a distinction between popular and artistic because they are, it is quite different. And you know, like it's, Japanese culture is basically very obvious. When you go there, you're totally bombarded with images. 
and names and music and so forth. And of course, one is better than the other, or you make these subjective choices. And Donald Rich is one of those people who can introduce everything to you, but he makes subjective choices in what he's writing about. So here's a guy who's interested in Ozu. He was a friend of, uh, of uh, Kawabata, the writer Kawabata, and Mishima. He was a close friend of, and associate of these two Japanese writers. Um, and again, R Richie exposed filmmakers like Ozu, who is considered sort of the classic, uh, traditional Japanese filmmaker. In fact, a lot of uh, 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 film people in Japan, when Richie required and worked on Ozu's work to be translated into English, and distributed in America, they thought he was a little insane because they thought, why would you want to show this filmmaker Ozu in the United States? Because they feel Ozu was too Japanese, too region focused. Um, of course, you know, we now look at Ozu as not only a great traditional filmmaker, Japanese filmmaker, and talking about Japanese family life and Japanese, you know, culture and, and social life, but there's definitely a thought that Ozu is almost basically a avant-garde filmmaker of sorts. He's a very much of a modernist filmmaker or artist working in a very, at the time, sort of a conservative format. So Richie exposed all these great people, and Richie would also being who he is, was the, I mentioned the gateway, bringing Japanese arts to America, but he was also the guy that people like Norman Mailer or Susan Songtag or... Tennessee Williams, when they come visit Japan for the first time, um, you know, you need, to, you need, when you go to Japan, you do definitely need somebody there to introduce you to the more interesting aspects of that particular culture. And Richie was the type of guy who brought, who was the, who could take, talk to Tennessee Williams and show Tennessee Williams the more colorful or more interesting aspects of Japanese culture or Tokyo culture, meaning uh, the gay nightclubs because Donald Ritchie was gay, and Tessie Williams was gay, of course, and um, Ritchie was very much of a bohemian figure. He's a, he is a bohemian, bohemian character who lived in Tokyo at the time, and his time period is, 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 is quite expansive. It's from like the late 40s to, he died just about oh, in the 20, early 21st century. So he's always been a prominent writer presence. So Donald Ritchie, and then <clears throat> Ian Baruma, I would think of him being not number two guy, but definitely associate of Donald Ritchie, or, or a guy who, um, a tutor, I mean, somebody who, a, a sensei, who, who Bar Baruma, I would say studied under Ritchie, but Ritchie, as Baruma first came to Japan, Ritchie became friends with him and introduced him to all different aspects of Japanese culture, including Baruma's main interest at the time, which was working in the cinema, which didn't pan out for him really, but more importantly, the theater, underground theater. And Buruma started working and meeting through uh, Ray Ritchie. He met people like Suji Teriyama. And Teriyama is a fascinating, interesting Japanese artist. He's a playwright, a poet, an essayist, uh, and wrote lyrics for various songs. But what's interesting about Teriyama is he's sort of a combination, and I'm using these comparisons very loosely just to give you an idea of who he, you know, his status in Japan is. He, Teriyama is a combination of somebody like Jean Cocteau and Andy Warhol to me. Um, Cocteau, because of the aesthetic, and, and, and Cocteau knew everybody in France. He knew all the artists. And I think Teriyama had, knew everybody as well. He knew Mishima, knew Donald Ritchie, of course, and he knew various other theater people. And uh, the Warhol connection. Well, okay, Warhol is a visual artist who made movies and did artwork, of course, but he also had a social scene where he had other artists attached to him and worked, like, for instance, like in Warhol's The Factory. And Teriyama had a theater group that consisted of a lot of interesting characters and a lot of really good artists who all work for Teriyama's theater group. And Teriyama made movies. He made like really interesting movies, or sort of like, again, sort of a, um, not again, but his movies sort of, for a Westerner, first looking at his work, you know, think of like um, probably Fellini. 
it's very colorful characters, a lot of makeup, very overacting, very um, um, decadent, very, you just want to be in that world, tell you the truth. And, um, and, and Teriyama used, you know, he had like a lot of great actors, a lot of cross-dressing performers, circus performers, there's like a circus motif. And um, Baruma picked up on that circus, like a like small village circus, not like a big circus, but like a small sort of decadent, shady circus. And Teriyama servers just sort of encaptures that world of circus life in a way. Not a real circus life, but sort of a legendary theatrical circus life. And um, so Teriyama is connected to a music, connected to the theater, of course, the films. Uh, there's an interesting composer by the name of J.A. Caesar, who is this underground Japanese rock guy, who's sort of like a combination of like traditional Japanese folk music with like heavy metal riff of Led Zeppelin. It's a weird combination, but it works. <laughs> Take my word for this. So Teriyama is somebody you want to remember later on because he's, he's an important figure in Japan in the late 60s and the 70s. And Buruma first went to Japan, moved to Japan in 1975. So he missed a lot of the early, the late 60s student revolts, um, demonstrations, the Shinjuku scene in the late 60s. But he was there in 75, and a lot of stuff was happening in 75, including Teriyama's working, and also um, um, uh, the, the theater scene at that time was very lively and very important. And uh, the height of Donald Ritchie. Uh, Mishima, who um, Buruma never met, but definitely knows of, because Mishima is probably at the time, and still is, probably one of the most popular Japanese writers for foreigners. Now it's um, Murakami, is definitely probably more popular now, uh, and a good writer. Mishima is way more interesting as a personality and as a figure, and I will do another show this focusing on Mishima in the near future. But uh, Mishima died in 1970. So uh, Baruma never had a chance to actually met him, but he met every all the other contemporary artists of that time and friends of Mishima who are still living and still working. And um, so reading a Tokyo romance, which to me is a Tokyo romance, a memoir, I don't like the title. A Tokyo romance, it's a weak title for this type of book. What's great about the Buruma book, a Tokyo Romance, is it's a great introduction for a Westerner learning more about Japanese culture. Culture that I find interesting, the underground stuff, the underground music, the underground theater, underground films, not this the Kurosawa, which is totally fascinating, or Ozu, which is incredibly fascinating, but more of the street scene, more of the, not punk rock, but sort of the, the punk do-it-yourself essence of these great, interesting Japanese artists. And uh, Bar Baruma eventually ended up with working for, in many ways, as well as appearing in his work, in his plays, is a guy named Kara Juro, who personally I never heard of. But he's another theater guy who I presume is his portent. This is probably great, or this is a portent is Teriyama's theater group. So Kara is another avant-garde theater group with a different aesthetic, but yet still very much out there, very much like street performances. And Kara might be actually more overtly political than uh, Teriyama at the time. And um, interesting about Buruma is he's John Selsinger's nephew. And, and Selsinger is the guy who did Midnight Cowboy. He directed Midnight Cowboy, the American film. And... Um, and he played a character in one of Kara's role as the Midnight Cowboy. And, um, and he also did Hitler. He played Hitler <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a Kara production. Anyway, Buruma is a really great writer. He's a really fascinating writer. And his observations about Tokyo, I find very close to mine. And um, again, I started going to Japan in 89, 1989. He's been there since the 70s at the time. And I think he stayed there for seven years. And um, you know, people go to Japan for different reasons. I went for family reasons because I'm married to a Japanese person. And I went there for family reasons. And then the cultural stuff is just additional reasons to be there. 
But Baruma went there basically to, to get into Japanese cinema and learn a Japanese theater, especially the avant-garde theater, because he was born in Holland or, or Amsterdam. And I think he saw a Teriyama performance in Amsterdam in the late 60s, and it totally, he just, he went overboard about it. So that's one of the reasons why he went to Japan, and which led to Donald Ritchie and so forth. Um, one of the interesting characters that Baruma meets and he interviews is an actress by the name of Yamaguchi Yoshiko, who I don't know anything about, but what a fascinating figure. This is a woman who made her first movie called China Nights. It was made during the, it was made during World War II, during the you know, when Japanese films were making propaganda films in China, which they occupied at the time. They needed a Chinese actress. So they hired her as the, her first movie, she's the star of this movie, and they pretend that she's a Chinese actress. She gets a Chinese name. And um, it was a big movie. It was a, fa it was a very popular movie in Japan. She became a star, a famous Chinese st uh, star. Eventually, after the war ended, it ends up, everybody finds out that she's Japanese, and actually, she, she, in China, she got in, um, right after the war, she got in trouble. She could have been executed as a spy or as a traitor of some sort. Uh, but luckily enough, she had Japanese papers, so she was clear from that. But she ended up, um, her career, she, she started making movies under her own name in Japan, but then she ended up as being Shirley Yamaguchi where she played in a movie uh, by Samuel Fuller called The House of Bamboo, which takes place in uh, occupied uh, American occupation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Japan, of Tokyo. So she was in this beam, great Sam Fuller B movie. And then afterwards of that, she served 18 years as a politician, uh, uh, as a, as a uh, for, the, uh, for the parliament, the part of the diet. So she was like a eight, so so she became a politician for eighteen years, and then eventually she started doing TV interviews. She had a show where she interviewed people like Idi Amin, and Mao, and you know, and 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 people in North Korea. So she handled like really brutal, tough dictators, who she happens to like personally. She liked all these people. She loved Mao. So she's just a really interesting person, and obviously, one would want to read a biography on this on this actress. Uh, I don't know if there is one in English. But anyway, so Baruma writes about interesting people like that. He, he meets really interesting people. He writes about them. And in a way, he sort of bases his life on Donald Ritchie because I never had a problem. I never had a problem being in Japan or living in Japan. But others have had problems adjusting to the Japanese way of life and systems. And, you know, if you're like American, you're always going to be American in Japan, you know. And for Americans, identity is important, the same as Japanese, but different degrees of importance. For Americans, it's always important to be an individual, to sort of stand out, to say stuff. Where in Japan, that's not important. And a lot of Americans have a hard time living in the confines of a Japanese structure or society. And Ian Baruma had that problem working with the Japanese theater where he's always the foreigner, the gaijin, they call him. Gaijin is a terminology, a Japanese terminology meaning you're, you're a foreigner, usually American foreigner. And uh, so he's always a foreigner. He's never like part of the group. And that sort of bugs him after many years. But he sort of learns from his mentor, Donald Ritchie, the writer who lived in Japan, that it's cool to be an outsider. He loved being a gaijin. He loved because it made him not be part of Japanese society. He's in his own island. And personally, I could, that's how I would live in Japan. I like being American or a foreigner in Japan more than being, trying to be part of a Japanese group or, or, or part of the Japanese world. I like to be sort of distance because for some reason or another, I have a greater admiration for that culture if I'm distanced from it. I'm like those, those British and French culture as well. And um, Richie sort of taught uh, Baruma this fact. And when you compare Baruma, especially Donald Richie, he reminds me very much like Paul Bowles uh, living in Morocco, because Bowles is never going to be a Moroccan or African. He's this white guy who always wears these elegant suits. 
and this, you know, like cigarette holder and looking this the ultimate decadent Westerner. You know, that's, that's, that's Paul Bowles' role. And I think Donald Ritchie sort of based that character. And he actually, more likely, he probably knew Paul Bowles. I'm sure he knew Bowles. So this is the world of a Tokyo romance by Ian Baruma. It's a really great book. I really recommend it. And especially, you know, there's very few books, in my opinion, many, many books about foreigners moving to Japan, living in Japan, and only a handful are great. The rest are like just terrible for some reason because their, their views are, their views are moronic or they're just like, this is stupid. But Buruma, due to his interest in Japanese theater arts and cinema, and he has good taste, like Donald Ritchie, it's an incredible entrance into uh, Japanese culture, the aesthetic culture, the, the culture of cinema of Japan, music of Japan, the theater of Japan. So I recommend A Tokyo Romance by Ian Buruma. This is Tosh Talks. I'm Tosh Berman. Bye-bye.